Uh, hi everyone. I'm Ali and I'll be presenting our work which we are still, it's underway, Unikernel Linux. And uh, as you can see, uh, many of the team members you might already know. Uh, some are from Red Hat, some from Boston University. There's Uli. Uh, we have Richard Jones uh, from uh, Red Hat, Larry Woodman and also Daniel joined us very recently. So I'll start off with why we're doing this, what's the motivation and uh, I'll share some uh, updates what we've gotten so far and what we're trying to do now. So as you already know, operating systems have been designed in a way that they multiplex resources between different uh, applications between different users. And they're doing a different, a really good job of, uh, of doing that. But things are changing now. For example, application design goals. Uh, you know, many of the applications are being deployed as uh, single application virtual machines uh, and even distributed systems where we have one application deployed across many single purpose virtual machines, things like that. So deployment, uh, deployment models are changing. We don't really need the, uh, in some cases, not in all cases, in some cases we don't really need the operating system to multiplex resources between different applications, different users, all that uh, logic that it has to uh, multiplex these resources, we don't need that. And we see that some of the applications are now being uh, re-implemented to bypass the kernel with uh, libraries such as uh, um, DPDK and SPDK uh, because kernel is now just in the way for some of the workloads. So researchers have been trying to uh, figure out a solution to this issue and one of the uh, solutions that they've come up with is a unikernel. So let's start. What is a unikernel? So this is how things normally run. Uh, you have different privilege levels. Uh, the kernel runs in ring zero. You have shared libraries and different processes. In a unikernel, there's just one single application and all the functionality that it needs, so there's flat address space. There's no separation between the kernel space and ad address space because there's just one application. Uh, and all the functionality that you need from the shared libraries and the operating systems is then statically combined into one uh, single binary, uh, which, is, which is small and lightweight uh, as compared to the normal uh, kernels and you can do lots of optimizations on it. Because the important thing is that this is statically linked together, you can do link time optimizations, you can do profile driven optimizations, things like that, once you have the final binary. So uh, researchers have shown in many different unikernels that a lot of different optimizations are possible. For example, ABRT, which uh, Jim and Tommy here uh, work on, uh, it has shown more than two times improved memcached performance. Uh, on 99th percentile, uh, percentile tail latency as compared to Linux. And there are many other examples of unikernels outperforming the uh, traditional operating systems. Uh, so let's discuss why have these uh, different research unikernels not been adopted in, uh, in production. And uh, the, the reason for that lies in how these are developed. So some researchers take the clean slate approach. They develop all the code from scratch. Uh, and the other approach is that you take an already uh, existing kernel, for example, NetBSD, and strip it down to create a unikernel, which is the rump run. And both of these cases, so the unikernels that are created, as we saw earlier, have great optimizations, but uh, as with any operating system approach, it will take years to build a community around these uh, unikernels, which can support and which can keep updating these unikernels. In the meantime, there's no uh, real adoption of these in, in, the, in, in production. So we asked ourselves a question and uh, mostly it was Uli and uh, my advisor Uran asking each other questions. Uh, they said that, okay, why can't we do this with Linux? Uh, we didn't know the answer. Can we make a, a unikernel based on Linux? So if, if it was possible uh, and if it could live an upstreamable target, which if in the, this is extremely important because if it is an upstreamable target, which means that the entire community can maintain it, can support it, things like that. We don't just want another huge uh, code base sitting on the side which we have to maintain. Uh, if this is possible, it will have the battle tested code that Linux has uh, and the large community that I already mentioned. And it will also have different performance advantages that unikernels have. Now we didn't know how much. Some unikernels, as I said, have shown great performance advantages. Will we, able, will we be, with this Linux unikernel, able to get those performance advantages? Will we be able to get close to them? Things like that. And what different optimizations are possible? So with these questions in mind, we decided to uh, 
give it a shot. Uh, our requirements from the very start were simple. We had to run unmodified applications and libraries. Uh, minimal changes in Linux and glibcs because if changes were huge, there's no chance these can get accepted upstream. So minimal changes. And from the get-go, we had to uh, demonstrate some performance benefits to have any uh, interest from the community. And the most obvious ways of doing that uh, were eliminating the ring transition overheads because we don't have different rings, uh, different ad uh, address spaces. So we can just have uh, uh, functions calls in, in, in place of system calls. And since everything is uh, statically linked together, we can have uh, cross-layer optimizations. There are different approaches we try to intermix kernel and application code, for example, user mode Linux, but it does not give you uh, that uh, single address space. There's still, still that separation between the uh, kernel and the application. You cannot do those uh, optimizations. Uh, Linux kernel library, which uh, is a very stripped down version of the kernel, which runs in user space and libOS, which is uh, right now. Uh, just the network stack as a library in user space. They uh, don't run unmodified applications and libraries and uh, as I said, extremely stripped down versions of, of uh, the Linux. So uh, that's they, those still don't meet our goals. Other approaches include, uh, why don't we just implement applications as Linux kernel modules? Again, huge changes in applications, everything will have to be ported to the kernel code and kernel mode Linux, which uh, allows the application to run in ring zero, but still that separation between the kernel and the application, you cannot do the cross, cross layer optimizations. So we decided to build the uh, unikernel Linux and I'll tell you the uh, higher level architecture overview. So this is how things normally run. Uh, the kernel comes up, it does the first, first exec VE call and brings up the user space and the user space has applications and the shared libraries, things like that. Applications make a uh, function call into the glibc normally, and then glibc makes system calls into the kernel. This is how things normally run. But in our case, as I said, there's no separation between the different address spaces, so we don't need these system calls. Instead, when the kernel comes, uh, comes up, it calls a symbol, kmain, which is defined in the application. So a function call, application makes function call into glibc now, for glibc to make functions called to the kernel, we just had a very small uh, stub library, which we call the UK library. All it does is, is calls the required functionality uh, from within the kernel. So instead of uh, glibc making a write syscall, it will make a UK write function call. So you can write function call into the UK library, which has stubs for the functionality, which then calls the functionality into the kernel. And all of this is statically linked together. So this, this is the high level architecture overview. Uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, about our current build process. So normally when the kernel builds, uh, it has uh, different archives built in .as in different folders, different, di different directories, and uh, some uh, archives of libraries, which are then linked together into VM Linux. And as many of you already know, this linking stage is basically a few scripts which uh, link everything together. Now. We have more uh, things which need to be linked together. For example, the application, the glibc, UK library, and if you're using some other libraries as well, we all have different archives and object files. So what we did right now, we changed the kernel linking stage to not just include these uh, archives, to include all of this. And now uh, what we do is we just do a kernel make and the entire thing uh, becomes a unikernel. What we want to do in the future is that you can use your existing make files. For example, if you're trying to uh, build some application as, as a unikernel, you just have, you just do make and select the compiler target as a UKL GCC or something like that. And your application can be built into a unikernel. That's where we want to go. This is what we're currently doing. So I'll, I'll talk briefly about different uh, uh, challenges that we faced in in building this uh, unikernel, and after that, I'll uh, share what are what is the status right now, and what are the results that we got. So, as you know, conflicting thread models. Kernel uh, has K threads, and uh, applications run P threads. So, uh, how do we uh, uh, make sure that we have one consistent thread model without changing a lot 
yeah so why can't we just you know simply use these as is because p threads as you know use a large set of registers k threads don't they all have their own idiosyncrasies for example p threads use uh, a register for thread local storage the kernel uses some re register for its own per cpu context storage things like that so the question is how do we merge these two uh, conflicting thread models should we implement everything as p threads but that would mean a huge rewrite of the entire linux kernel we don't want that should we implement all threads as k threads but that would mean that all the performance optimiz uh, optimizations that glibc does because of the uh, large register set we don't have that so we don't want that can we just stack keep switching between these uh, to uh, threading models we don't want ex extra stack switches so uh, in the end uh, after uh, spending a lot of time on it in the end we found out that actually merging these two thread models is is simple and most of that is based on luck for example kernel uses the gs register for uh, per cpu uh, storage and uh, uh, glibc uses fs register for thread local storage things like that if that were not the case we would have to do something else but right now everything uh, works fine i'll let you know how so the kernel comes up it's running as a k thread the k thread basically actually becomes a p thread it runs the application code but for this first primordial thread to run application code we have to set it up in a way that uh, in a way glibc expects the first thread to be for example the thread local storage is properly set up right next to it is the thread control block that's properly set up things like that all these initialization functions that glibc has so what we do is after the kernel comes up instead of doing the first exec ve call we go into glibc initialization functions we modified them a bit just so that they can work together and when i say modified uh, modified uh, the number of fun uh, arguments a function takes things like that nothing major so the first primordial thread sets up we set up everything it starts running the code and after that all threads just run because p thread create takes uh, p thread create takes care of all the other threads and these threads when we go into the kernel we can execute kernel thread we can execute uh, uh, applications and glibc code so things like that so this all worked and uh, in the end it turned out to be easy but uh, took a lot of uh, investigation and the interesting thing here is that we didn't change k threads in any way so all the background kernel tasks they still run as k threads no changes there uh yes how, there was another question how to get uh, all different p thread uh, functions to work for example p thread create things like that so uh i'll give you an example of the clone call clone is a special call as you know because there are it returns twice so uh do we need separate stacks which are uh, handled by entry syscall normally the thing is what we did was instead of going into the clone call and uh, when we normally go into the clone call the entry uh, syscall uh, function that is which is it takes care of everything it goes on to a as you know on a on a temporary stack it creates a new uh, uh, th thread goes on to another temporary stack and then it returns and when you return you have everything set up properly but now since we are not doing that we are not actually doing the syscall uh, uh, thing we had to slightly modify these things for example now we make the function call it goes into the into a uh, into our own function in the same uh, same uh, file which all it does is uh, mimics what the kernel does instead of doing it on temporary stacks we do it on the same stacks and when the new thread returns its uh, stack is properly set up the uh, original thread that works just fine so uh, uh, clone also just work we had to introduce a new uh, clone flag called ukl because of uh, of the changes that we made we didn't want to uh, it it to affect the normal functionality of uh, do fork function so things like that okay so yes uh, this is what we uh, were looking at recently how do we switch between uh, different uh, p threads now the thing is scheduling normally occurs on user kernel boundary once you do a syscall the, uh, you give up the uh, control to the kernel the kernel, kernel does all these housekeeping tasks it might switch different tasks around since we don't have that boundary the p threads were not being uh, scheduled properly if a thread runs it runs because uh, that's what happens in a non preemptible kernel uh, 
So what we did was we used, used a preemptible kernel. Everything works. Uh, also, uh, Daniel Oliveira, who recently joined our team, uh, he's, he works at Red Hat. He was interested in the project, so he started uh, uh, contributing to it. He he's written a patch which does uh, which mimics this uh, kernel uh, user boundary because we have the UKL library. So that is a very clean uh, point where we have we know we're going into the kernel code. So he mimics that, and now uh, it works for uh, a non preemptible kernel as well. Memory management. As you all know, that application normally lives in the lower range of uh, of the memory ad of the address uh, space, and kernel lives in the upper range. Applications text data live here. The kernel, and then there's the M map area. The kernels text and data live in the in the uh, higher range. And all of these different range ha ranges have their own uh, memory management primitives. Now, since everything is linked together statically. Applications, text, and data also live along with the kernel. Now, what do we do about MMAP? How do we do? Um, what do we do about malloc? Actually, so the question is: Should we just map malloc to vmalloc? But that would mean that, uh, as Larry always mentions, it would break a lot of applications which rely on that uh, on on uh, bit uh, arithmetic. So, what the last bit is, things like that, and. We want to use the general purpose performance optimized uh, functionality of glibc's malloc. We just don't want to use simple vmalloc. Uh, what about mmap? Where do we have? Where do we uh, do the mmap? Which range do we select for mmap? Things like that. Now the problem that uh, that we faced was that the first K thread memory management structs are not set up properly uh, for it to use the lower end of memory, the user end of memory. So what we did was. Uh, that first K thread, which becomes the P thread, along with uh, doing the glibc uh, initializations before that, we do a memory uh, struct initializations as well. So we initialize everything perfectly. Now the thread knows that okay, we have access to this uh, lower end of memory as well. So as soon as as soon as it goes into glibc, glibc does malloc, malloc does mmap, we start getting memory from the lower range. So everything works like it should. And it also helps us with future optimizations. For example, if you have uh, in the future, if we uh, uh, allocate a buffer, for example, network buffer in the kernel's address space, we can just instead of doing copy to user, copy from user, things like that, we can just move that uh, pointer to that uh, buffer uh, all along, and we can do zero copy networking. And finally, when it's time to free that buffer, we can just have a check: okay, where does it, uh, where, where does this buffer lie in the user range, in the kernel range, and just uh, free it accordingly. So we'll talk about that. Uh, another issue we faced was namespace issues. Glibc and kernel uh, have uh, routines which have the same names. For example, mem move, mem set. Uh, how how do we uh, fix these? Do we rename them? Do we keep the kernel versions only? Again, as I said, we don't want to get rid of the performance optimized glibc ver versions of these things. Should we just keep glibc versions? That would mean uh, some things, in, a lot of things in the kernel would break, and we would have to fix that. Things like that. So earlier, what we did was we just suppress glibc's version and use the kernel versions. But now, what we're doing is we're Partially linking glibc, the application, and all the libraries separately, and uh, linking the kernel separately, and then we do a final linking step. So everything uh, resolves correctly. Uh, a little about, a bit about the implementation. We added a Linux config option so that all the changes that we make to the Linux kernel uh, are nicely separated in if diffs. So if you just turn off that flag, you know, your unikernel Linux flag off, what you build is a normal Linux kernel. Uh, as I said, we changed the Linux kernel uh, linker script. So now, because now we have uh, uh, segments which are not usually present in the kernel, for example, thread TLS, uh, thread local storage uh, segments, things like that. So we had to uh, change that a bit. Uh, we are using the latest kernel. I uh, forgot to update it, which is now it is 5.3. We are using that now. And now we have around 500 lines which we have modified in the kernel. This is a highly bloated number because a lot of this is just uh, the clone uh, call which is, a lot, which is a lot of assembly language things like that but uh, mostly it's just a couple of hundred lines which we've changed and most of it is just simple if diffs uh, 
and uh, changing the uh, syscall name to a function call name. For example, write to jukil, write things like that. Very minimal, uh, non-invasive changes. glibc, uh, wherever in the glibc code base where we have a syscall, we just uh, instead of that we are uh, doing a, we are rewriting it as a function call, and all those changes are being done in a separate directory, separate subfolder. So the rest of it is, is uh, nicely separated from the rest of glibc code. Things like that. So uh, this basically fulfills our earlier goal of minimal changes in Linux and glibc so that when we are ready, when this thing is ready, we have some uh, uh, a higher chance of getting accepted upstream. People who work with the Linux community a lot, for example Larry, they think that these changes are uh, minimal enough, non-invasive. I actually have, don't uh, have no experience, so I'm just going with what they say. So. Uh, what we did for the initial evaluation, we did a simple TCP echo server. We deployed a simple C code as a normal application in user space on a Linux kernel running on MQMU. And then we took the same C code, built it as a unikernel, and deployed that on top of uh, inside QMU. So same code, it was single threaded. And this is the uh, result for the normal case where the application is running as uh, where the TCP echo server is running in, in the application on a normal kernel. And this is what we got with the with the single uh, with the same code run, running as a unikernel. Where you can see uh, less than half the average latency and 41% lower 99% tail tail latency. But we don't know where these numbers are coming from. What is the uh, thing driving the, this performance gains. What is it just the system call overhead we're getting rid of? Is there something else that we're doing? So now uh, we have interns uh, who are working on uh, getting perf to run inside the unikernel as a simple kthread and doing uh, perf kvm uh, from outside to just see what is actually going on. And so as uh, Quran says uh, all the time that we should not look at these numbers. The main interesting result of what we did is that we have an existence proof that it works. We don't know where the numbers are coming from and we'll probably uh, do more experiments later on, do uh, performance evaluation and we then we we'll know okay, where, where are these numbers actually coming from. So I'll tell you a bit about current status now. As I said, uh, we have p-threads working so we have multi-threaded support we have multi-threaded tcp server running as well and all things multi-threaded all things all things simple multi-threaded now what we're doing is we are trying to run memcached unikernel which is i feel very close to completion uh, we have different when we run it we have different threads uh, spawning we have things like that it is uh, right now it is failing where somewhere in the code there's a syscall which we have uh, not changed yet so things like that. So it's it's very close to completion. The very cool thing that I felt was that memcached uh, compared to a simple TCP server is a bigger code base. So we had memcached libevent, glibc, and the Linux kernel all linked together perfectly. The kernel boots up and goes into the memcached code and everything runs. That was uh, I felt I felt very cool. Uh, soon when we have memcached working, we'll uh, we'll uh, update our Git repo and uh, how you can test it and build it, things like that. So experiences, uh, we feel that we spent a lot of time investigating different things and in the end, uh, the changes that we had to make to get that thing to work was just a couple of line changes, things like that. And that happened all the time. So uh, in a way, it feels like this is something which is meant to be. Uh, that, you know, it's, uh, there's a huge problem, a couple of line changes, done. Uh, limitations, as you all know, fork doesn't work, uh, which means that you can have as many threads as you want, but you can't have different processes running uh, because, as you know, it's a unikernel. We have a few development tasks, as I told you, we're working on memcached, we're working on uh, getting uh, to a point where you can just use your own uh, make files and just type make. Uh, then, when we have everything mature enough, then we'll think about uh, or how to package it in a way that we can send it upstream or just begin a discussion upstream. And after that, all the fun part begins. We can do all sorts of optimizations. What can we do? We Can, can we do uh, link time optimizations? Can we do profile-driven optimizations? How much uh, performance benefit does that give us? And can we uh, show performance close enough to what different research unikernels have shown? Things like that.
So, just to conclude, research unikernels have shown that uh, there are advantages to be had, and Linux has always integrated new ideas into its code base. We feel that unikernels can be the next natural uh, step for Linux, and our prototype and the work we've done so far has given us some confidence that there are performance benefits and that we can get with modest changes. Thank you. Uh, questions? Job. This is as fast as I can. Is this x86 64 only? Yes, right now. Um, is Are there any plans for anyone else to work on other architectures? If people want to join us. The changes are minimal, really. I would uh, not rush to doing it in a different architecture. Because the first one to it this way. Yeah, certainly. I'm just I'm wondering like what, what sort of changes would be required for something like uh, power. Minimal. So I think clone is the only assembly code we are touching. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and if uh, some architecture uses the same register for uh, thread local storage and <coughs> per CPU storage, then we might have to do something fancy. But it's done differently. Yeah. And I'm using registers, so perhaps Wait. want a register, but there are, there are details which we can do because it's offsets. Wait. Offsets are not architectures. Um, have you looked at all yet at actually deploying these in a platform like Kube? What is that? Kube. Have you tried running any of these like in Kubernetes? Kubernetes. Well, the, one of the ideas obviously behind these kind of things, one of the motivations is to make uh, function as a service faster. So one of the targets which we are going to look at after, for instance, Matash Neons on is to get scripting languages like Node, Python, and so on up and running into that, and then we'll do the measurements. So Tommy talked yesterday about caching, uh, uh, startup times, and so on. We can do this with this as well. So we can bring up, uh, partly even uh, bring up the, uh, an interpreter of something that have this is the nanosecond startup kind of function as a service. We have a question here. Thank you. Um, so this is really great work. I've followed it uh, ever since you guys published the paper, um, and I've, I've liked it. Um, Ulrich, you kind of preempted something that I was going to ask about, though. Uh, you talked about interpreters. So I was wondering what happens when something wants basically like a file system um, or to load things from file systems, things like that. Uh, is that going to be difficult with the interpreter model or what, what are your thinking thoughts there? No, so one of the things, and let me, I, I, let me answer this kind of thing because this is something which I've been thinking about for a long time and it just hardly hasn't had the time because by the way, Ali and Peru are doing the, are doing the work. <laughs> So it's, the rest of us are just cheering down the sidelines. So, but uh, one of the things, the startup, startup mechanisms, which uh, we have been thinking about, which I want them to implement, is basically that we need the equivalent of the init scripts in there as well, and we will have this kind of part of the build system, so that instead of having scripts, we will generate, basically have a kind of a compiler for these kind of things, which translates the description of what your init is supposed to look like into a code which is then linked in or executed before we jump into K-Main. So with that, you can mount any arbitrary file system. Then the same functionality is there, it's a normal kernel functionality. Yeah. Like we had the uh, network all set up. And for the network, we have it now hard-coded in some way or form, so this yeah. is the early version of this kind of thing. This actually happens before we get the opinion. This just has to be generalized. Okay, that's great. We have a question over there. Oh, jeez. Woo! <laughs> so, um, by structuring this as a target, does this make it uh, incompatible with other targets, such as like user mode Linux? Um, well, not at the same time, definitely. 
but it will be just another target. Well, I guess my question is, would it be possible to essentially build a user mode Linux uh, unikernel? I haven't thought about this. I very much doubt that uh, it would immediately work, if, and given the lack of interest in developing UML to some extent, I don't know, it might linger around for a while before someone does the work. So in theory, it could work, yes. But we're, we're literally, so there's ARC, uh, ARC UM as a target and so on. We are introducing ARC X to the 6 UKL. So it will be some restructuring necessary. OK, thank you. Uh, any more questions? Thank you.